Well, I'm just a pastor. I guess ever since I was called into ministry, the ministry of the ordained, that's all I have ever wanted to be, a pastor. I'm in my 31st year of it. It seems impossible. I love pastoring. I love it because I love people. It's not always easy. I don't think any of us who are pastors can say that. But then by the counsel of my wife, I can say it's not always easy to love me all the time either. But right now, there is nowhere else on earth that I would rather be than among the people I serve, in the community I serve, as a mission station for Christ. And I'm very clear about that. We are one of God's mission stations, happen to be located in Dallas Town, and I'm so proud of them. I tell people that, including fellow pastors, and there is not one person, not one person, whom I am not delighted is there, and I really mean it. But when I say that, people respond, especially pastors have responded, well, that can't be true. You've got to have someone there who tests every fiber of your patience. Well, I can say that that is true, but I'm still delighted they're there. Then they say, well, you probably don't have any weird people there. I see you know what I'm talking about. I happen to attract weird people. <clears throat> I was tempted to point to... <laughs> well, the delegates raised themselves up already, so you can test that out. We have a middle-aged fellow in our church who sometimes thinks that he's Jesus. He fades in and out of this role from time to time. He grows a beard, and he's gotten hold of an alb, uh, that style of dress some of them are being worn here this evening. That style of dress that uh, somehow is popular among clergy. He has the cincture, and I think he imagines that is how Jesus dressed. And he has flip-flops, of course. On occasion, he whisks here and there in the building, welcoming people to his house for worship. He's not offensive about it. He's quiet about it. He's humble. But it is different, to be sure. In addition, he comes to church in an old clunker kind of gives the second coming of Jesus a little bit of a twist in my imagination. Now this isn't something that happens all the time with him, but I admit that when it does happen, I know that there are some folks who are watching and they're wondering, what's the pastor going to do? When is he going to put a stop to this? Well, one of the board members did finally ask me to approach him and I said, no, not me. I'm not touching this. And I'm thinking to myself, Jesus surprised us once being born of the Virgin Mary. He may be Jesus for all I know. <laughs> Not too many years ago, there was a very moving book written with the title, The Three Christs of Ypsilanti, written by Dr. Milton Rokiak. He was at the time the chief psychiatrist of the Ypsilanti State Hospital in Michigan, and his story is the narrative of three lost men, all three claiming the same identity, Jesus. And he observed, all three, all three, he said, were searching for ways to recover their sense of self-identity and rise above their loneliness. All three were searching for ways to rejoin the human race, and of course, they couldn't. They couldn't do it. For so long as they made that claim of themselves that they were God, they could not become human. So think carefully about that the next time you get yourself a Messiah complex. But that is one of the things I'm most proud of at our church right now. We've gotten ourselves to the place where everyone is welcome. Everyone, especially Jesus. And I mean that. There are people there who have been pushed aside at other places, and they have found some welcome and care in the place where I find myself just now. I love it there. But then I love every place where I have served. I truly have every place. I am a pastor, a servant of Christ, a servant, and I walk by faith. Today we are speaking of the river flowing in us. It's the theme through the day, and we're talking about the interior life. We call it the life of faith. We walk by faith. And so I hope 
we can dig some deeper wells into faith tonight. They are not new wells. The women and men whose lives we celebrate today, who we are remembering, they have dug those wells and they have enjoyed and tasted the waters that have flowed from them by faith. By faith, they dug the wells. They dug them in times of spiritual drought in order to find the water that lies very deep. And they've also taken of that water in the freshness of the spring when the snow has melted and the rains have been plentiful and the wells that they dug have overflowed with abundance. And our colleagues, our colleagues in ministry, our friends, our beloved, they have taken the water in every season of their lives. And in our turn, we have enjoyed the water too. I take heart in the book of Genesis Isaac, the story reads, digged again the wells of water which they digged in the days of Abraham his father for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham and he called those names by the same names by which his father had called them. We're digging wells that our fathers and mothers in the faith knew and they dig the wells which were dug before them by their fathers and mothers and all have been sustained by drinking of this deep, Water, the waters of faith. Paul knew it. Paul knew about these waters. It was the way he lived, by faith. When he writes to Timothy, as we heard read this evening, he is in prison. The end is near. Some people die in an instant, and they are never given the chance to reflect on their past, but he's in prison, and Paul has a lot of time. Out of his reflection, he writes to Timothy, offering advice born out of his years of experience, preach the word, Timothy, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. But then he gets to the real heart of his own reflections. I am already being poured out as a drink offering as a drink offering, for my departure is at hand. I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Oh, what a benediction. What a benediction to place on one's life. How beautiful. Let's offer it on behalf of our departed brothers and sisters that this crown of righteousness has been given to each of them. It's a crown of glory that you and I can only dream about. This message is about faith. The Bible said, as we heard read in Hebrews, that it is impossible to please God without faith. We are not talking about salvation faith only here. You are saved by faith. No, we're going beyond too, to sanctifying faith. Faith that is a gift of the Holy Spirit. One of those listed in 1 Corinthians 12 faithfulness. It is a faith listed in one of the fruits of the Spirit, listed in Galatians 5. It is faith that really makes you believe that God is alive, that you can walk with God and talk with God along the pilgrim way, even in the middle of a barren land. There is God, right there, right now. Do you have that kind of inward strength? Do you know that kind of peace? Paul did. How did he know? By faith. How can we make this real for our lives? I asked the Lord to help me make this message about faith real somehow. I don't want to stand up here for an hour and 20 minutes and preach. And (laughs) Even the bishop's eyes got wide. (laughs) Have faith. (laughs) There may be some of you who have come to this annual conference and your family is struggling. You may have a son who can't find work, or a daughter who has decided to stray and is in danger of being lost to you, and you've almost given up hope. Don't. Don't. We are talking about faith tonight. Maybe some of you have come with a sickness, or a loved one is now living with the dreaded C word, cancer, and you've given up hope. Have faith. What does the Bible say as in Hebrew as we read? Faith, what does it say? Faith is the substance, the substance of things hoped for, 
It is not positive thinking. It is substance, something you can stand on. It's not an emotional catharsis when we get all happy in our salvation and feel good. It's not warm fuzzies. It's substance. It goes deep. It's being sure of what we hope for. It is certainty of things we do not see. And then there is the whole litany of spiritual heroes who, heroes who live by faith. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel. Forty verses. And the writer of Hebrews drives home the point. Those who live in God live how? By faith. By faith. It's faith that you can put your hands on. It's faith you can trust in. So where do you get faith like that? We're told that faith comes by hearing. By hearing. Hearing what? Hearing what? The word of God. We are told more, the more of this word you know, the greater your access to faith. You can't be a stronger follower of Christ without spending more time in his word. Read the Bible out loud every now and then. It's a good exercise. Let it soak in. How about Genesis? Close your eyes if it helps. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Think about that. Darkness covered the face of the deep. The Holy Spirit was hovering over the face of the deep. Sound effects. Out of the brooding of the Holy Spirit, God said, let there be light. And bang, a billion shafts of light. All the spectrums of color split the darkness. And God said, whoa. No, pastor, you say. God said that was good. Are you kidding me? The whole cosmos is this inky, inky darkness. And with the spoken word of God, there is a massive laser show. And God said, that's good. I like to imagine God saying to an angel, go blow that out. I want to do that all over again. (laughs) This is incredible. Faith comes by hearing the word of God, and yet we struggle with the highest percentage of biblical illiteracy we can imagine, where Christians think they can get by with an eighth grade biblical understanding of the scriptures. What have you done? of any importance in your life that you could get by with an eighth grade knowledge of education. For five decades now, I have heard the lament over the Bible not being read in the schools anymore. This isn't nearly so tragic. Not nearly so tragic as the Bible not being read in our homes anymore. Faith is the substance... Faith is the substance that comes by hearing. Two years ago this past May, my wife, daughter, and I had the chance to cruise the Mediterranean region, Egypt, Ephesus, Corinth, Rome. And in Rome, I called to mind the old Mamertine prison, where legend tells that both Paul and Peter in their turn were kept before their death. There was a church built over the site in the 16th century, much later, to preserve the site. It was used as a prison for 11 centuries, and the last known use of it was in the 4th century. Here, tradition tells, Paul spent his last days before being beheaded. Now, for those of you who think the Christian faith promises a trouble-free life, you had better think again. Because Paul's beheading pokes a big hole in that whole stinking theory of prosperity. Pardon my adjective. (laughs) Paul wrote from that prison and two of his letters were to Timothy. Chapter 4 is his last will and testament. He wrote, Timothy, wherever you go, preach the word. Go ahead, reprove, correct, but preach the word. He knew he was going to lose his head before too much time passed. But does he complain, oh God, what have you done to me? What did I do to deserve this end, God? I follow the living Christ, and this is where it landed me. No. Here's what he says. The time of my departure is at hand. What class? Almost beats John Wesley, who said from his deathbed, some of you know it, best of all, God is with us. Paul said, the time of my departure is at hand. It seems so matter-of-fact, like... My plane's about to leave at 5 o'clock. 
I fought a good fight. I finished the course. Henceforth, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Timothy, he says, Demas has left me. He got to Rome, got all caught up in Rome's worldly ways. He left me, headed back to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Dalmatia and Titus to Galatia. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. I hope you can come before winter because if I make it that long, I'm going to need my coat and my scroll. Bring Mark with you. I left my coat and scrolls in Troas and I sure could use them. Only Luke is here, my friend Luke. Every now and then I see him looking down through the hole in the cell above, calling, Paul, are you all right, Paul? It's good to see you, Luke. He's the only one with me. All the others have gone. Come, come if you can. Gives me a new perspective on those in nursing homes who long for someone, anyone to visit them and bring a human touch. But we're redigging old wells tonight. Our brothers and sisters before us dug them too and found that faith is alive. Faith has substance. You can count on it. You can trust it. And the more you know of the Word of God and its drama, the more potential you have for an increase of faith. As I asked before, did you come to this auditorium tonight with a longing in your heart? Some family member that you desperately want to see meet Christ. Some domestic situation about to explode and you would love to see it diffused. A financial burden that you've been carrying. I don't know. But you have this powerful ache. If only, if only, well, faith is the substance of things longed for, that you pray for, that you so desperately want. And there is no evidence anywhere of it happening, but your faith still holds solid as a rock because it is not built on the circumstances around you, but on the promise of the living God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. In Hebrews, we read in the third verse, everything that God made, everything that God made that we can see, that we can see God made out of things that we cannot see. So God made them out of nothing. So you see, we who are so quick to say to God, I would like to help God, but I don't have anything. Well, congratulations. You're in business for nothing is exactly the raw material that God has been looking for in you. God loves it best, and God will always use it. So what does this faith look like when you see it? How is this faith exercised in a way that becomes a blessing? Well, if you're paying attention, you will see the substance of faith in many places. Whenever I go to the beach where there is a boardwalk, I love to sit on a beach and watch people. I don't know, maybe it's a sign of my age. Except when I take a youth group, I make it their assignment to sit on the boardwalk and watch people too. I ask them to watch for half an hour, and then for devotions later in the evening, I ask them to report back what they had seen, what they had observed in the people who passed by. It's just a study in human nature and watching people. One evening, I was sitting there just before dark. The beach was clear, and the boardwalk was beginning to fill up. I was watching people in Wildwood that day. Wildwood says a lot about me, huh? (laughs) When I saw a group of college students, and they were pushing their fellow student in her wheelchair, they approached the ramp that led down to the sand, and they pushed her down there. I began to wonder what could possibly be going on as their struggle began, as they pushed her across the sand to the water. It was slow going. It's a long beach there, soft sand. Finally, they made it, pushing the wheelchair into the waves, just enough, just enough, so their friend could put her feet into the water, just deep enough for her to feel the saltiness of the sea and the push of the waves. Since they had Illinois sweatshirts on, I had a feeling that this might be this young woman's first and perhaps her last opportunity to ever feel the sea. The faith of her friends issued forth in such a love that they would do this for her. 
That's what faith looks like when it takes substance. Their faith turned into their work. I saw it even earlier as my wife and I were visiting California for our honeymoon. This was long ago. We were young and in love. I still love her just as desperately as ever. But we decided to go and watch the sunset into the Pacific Ocean. We went to a high promontory that was known for its views and we parked our car. I was still in seminary. We didn't have much. We were doing it on the cheap and we had rented a car under the rent a rec sign. You remember them? (laughs) But then another car pulled up into the parking lot overlooking the cliffs and the sea below. We pulled into the parking space where the lines were indicated in our windshield and looked straight out into the ocean. But this car came and took up three spots. Now, our renter wreck was bad, but their car was worse. As we watched, there was an older couple who apparently had had their child in their later years. We discerned that the boy was severely handicapped, clearly unable to move himself from the back seat of the car to a a place where he could enjoy the sunset. But this elderly man and woman got out of the car And they began to pull and tug at the boy until they could turn him and position him where his feet could dangle over the seat outside the car. And then they waited. We all waited. And just as the sun turned into a giant ball ball of blaze orange to dip below the horizon, turning all the clouds purple with the blazing shades of pink and orange and purple, the technicolor of the sky, we watched this older couple take their son's drooping head in their hands and they lifted it up and just pointed him out there. They pointed him out there as if to say, There you are, my boy. There you are. Do you see it? Look at the glory of God's creation and know this. You matter. You matter. You matter to us and you matter to God. Their faith was of such substance that it issued forth in a love that would not exclude him from a powerful moment where the glory of God could be seen by those who would look. This older couple had a faith that turned into work with their beloved boy. You see, it makes no sense to confess on Sunday, I believe in God the Father Almighty, and then on Monday, not look for God's Holy Spirit to work in extraordinary ways. It makes no sense. And I do not want to stand away from this pulpit until you are convinced. Faith without works is dead, James writes. This faith looks like something. It's not held on the interior only. It is something that explodes from the well, and it looks like love. That is the substance. We must constantly ask the same question. The faithful men and women whom we memorialize this evening always asked out of their faith. We have to dig the same wells. Oh Lord, what do you want me to do about this? And the faith of a person, the faith of a church, a people of God will always be determined by the willingness of the people to go into the world with their mops and buckets and do some cleaning because we love that world as much as God does. So what is the great burden in your heart? What is the longing that you wish for, you hope for, you pray for asking, Oh God, do something in my life here. I need you so desperately. And then believe it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, longed for, comma, the evidence of things not even seen. Doesn't look like there's a snowball's chance in the heat of summer of it ever happening. What did you think I was going to say? (laughs) No snowball's chance. Then what are you going to do about it? Where are you going to go? Who do you need to talk to? How do you need to pray? Without faith, it is not possible to please God. So, work for greater and greater faith. 
Go deep, men and women. Go deep, young people. If you have been on cruise control with your faith, if you've been on a plateau in your faith, if you've just been holding steady, it's time to go deep and very deep. And the time is now. You have no permission to wait. No permission. Amen and amen.